Um, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, program this evening with an issue that's been uh, in the forefront of a lot of people's minds, been discussed a lot in the listserv, um, masks, masks, masks. Uh, <laughs> uh, when to wear them, when not to wear them, uh, how necessary are they? Um, uh, all of those questions will be addressed um, and with uh, special guest, Dr. Jim Smith, and of course, our, our erstwhile host, Dr. Dr. Cynthia Hawk. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Susan now, and I'll say a couple of words at the very end about things going on here in the community. Thank you. So anyone who is new here, Hobart is the chair of the uh, homeowners, Rep homeowners Representative Board, uh, and we're, we're grateful to have his leadership. Um, so a few points of facilitation. We go for an hour, no more. We have learned sleep is important to us. Uh, we will use the chat this evening once we've um, completed the questions that we have, and we're doing that because City pointed out to me that it's important to keep the community engaged. I do not monitor the chat um, because it's hard to lean into it, um, but I have Zach here to do that for me. Um, so here we go. As I said, um, Dr. Cynthia Hawk is the chair of family medicine and has been our um, fireside um, host all along. It's been wonderful to have you, Cindy. Uh, and um, I can't mute myself, sorry. Sorry, um, <laughs> part of my day. Um, uh, and we have Dr. Jim Smith. Uh, Jim's a UCI professor of chemistry, an aerosol expert who studies how things uh, like dust and water droplets behave in the air. For the past month, he has been studying the filtration abilities of homemade masks and materials and developing simple and effective mask designs. And thank you, Jim, for sharing your website. That was helpful as well. So what I do, well, what we've been doing is a weekly check-in because each week we're learning so much. I'll start with you, Cindy. How has this week been for you? Well, I'll say it's, it's been a good week and in many ways a bit of a relief because again, uh, we are not seeing the increase in numbers of patients affected in Orange County, and we've been able to handle the patients that have fallen ill. So we hope that we've reached a plateau, and, and we look forward to the time when the number of cases is clearly decreasing. We're not there yet, and we're also concerned that as we relax the restrictions and people are interacting more, we're likely to see a bump in the number of cases. On the other hand, it was a bright sunny day and part of the good news is it seems like hot sunshine isn't so friendly to this virus and so maybe the weather will be in our favor. Uh, of course, we're also so concerned about the number of people in our community affected by the loss of jobs, the loss of income, schools, housing, food, and more. And so uh, it's certainly a troubling time for many people. And I personally, I feel a, a, a deep sense of pride in the way people are coming together to support one another and a deep sense of gratitude for the beautiful and safe community where we live. Thank you, that was beautiful. I agree. Jim, how about you? Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess, uh, for the past week, I've, I've been um, pretty overwhelmed really about uh, the volume of research that's taking place nowadays, uh, particularly in this area that I'm not an expert at, but I'm obviously very uh, interested in, which is the aerosol transmission of the coronavirus. It just seems like every day there's another uh, dozen or so new studies, uh, many of which have not yet gone through peer review, but because it's so important, we, we still need to know about them. We still need to uh, read them. And uh, it, it really is overwhelming. Uh, 
and it also it makes you really cause uh, gives you cause to pause and think about how um, how we deal with uncertainty and probabilities and and how we uh, deal with risk really it's essentially it's a um, it's a question of, of what uh, constitutes risky behavior in terms of um, transmission, any kind of transmission of a, of a virus like this. And, 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 and I think a lot about how I go about my daily life with this idea of, of risk uh, and, 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 and in a way also how I consider my own actions in, in, with regards to uh, the transmission of, of this disease because I could be asymptomatic. Uh, and, and so how is it, what is my role in this community uh, knowing what I do about aerosol transmission, knowing the uncertainties, and knowing um, knowing that uh, I could be, you know, part of the problem. And so a lot of these thoughts go spinning through my head as I'm walking around uh, my community. And so, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll probably talk a little bit about some of those. Well, Jim, you know, at, I don't, I hope you don't mind if I ask a question, but I would really love to hear your summary of the risk of transmission from droplets versus aerosol and and if you could help us understand what are the risks as far as we understand today because it seems to keep changing uh yeah it does doesn't it i mean uh so so first of all it's like i say it's an area that is uh that's that's just exploding in terms of the amount of uh, information and uh, that that's being released. Um, there's there's two questions really. One uh, which I think we we all uh, um, can uh, can agree upon. I think it's not uh, such a controversial question, and that is, um, do people emit? Um, aerosols. Do people not just emit, you know, spit and uh, and larger droplets that you have to stand maybe three feet away, maybe even six feet away to avoid? The question is whether or not uh, my speaking to you right now is filling this room up with microscopic particles. And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, I, it, it's uh, it's very much a function of. Um, how good the ventilation is. I happen to be right now in a, in a laboratory uh, with really good ventilation. If I were in my room, the air would exchange maybe once every one to three hours. And so um, those particles stick around for a long time. Okay, so that's one thing. The other thing is how many of these particles, uh, if I were a carrier of this, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, how many of those would actually contain a uh, infectious virus and that is the real question um, there's one study uh, of the flu which says about 0.1 percent of those um, particles could contain an infectious virus there's also and so it doesn't sound like much but think of the fact that uh, a cough uh, gives you uh, will emit 300,000 particles so 0.1% of those particles uh, would still be about 300 particles that could have an infectious virus in it. Uh, and so there's that. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so, so I think, I think there's, there's just a lot of big questions that come out. I mean, it's not a simple uh, enough question to ask. Um, the real question really is, uh, is, is just, like I say, how comfortable people are with with the uh, with the probabilities uh, and 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 whether you know what to what precautions do you wish to make uh, to protect yourself from those? Well, Jim, these numbers are great because you can then go from there to ask how many infectious particles does it take to cause That's an infectious an infection? Yeah, I guess I guess the other point I I, I lost my, my second point, but I just got it back. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is that there's been a lot of now a lot of um, uh, studies uh, where people have gone into hospitals and gone into uh, to various settings and uh, have searched for evidence of aerosol transmission of the virus. And in some cases, they found pretty strong evidence that, that supports the idea that uh, the virus could actually uh, become airborne, uh, perhaps even for, for, uh, for you know, an hour or more. And in one case in Guangzhou in China, 
uh, one asymptomatic carrier was in a restaurant uh, and they actually could trace uh, and then and it, it was actually the cause of a small outbreak and they could actually trace the uh, group of people in the restaurant that, that, that became infected to the path of the air conditioning system as it blew from one side of the room to the other. So there's some pretty strong evidence to suggest, especially indoors, um, that uh, that that there is a uh, that there is a, a, a you know pretty strong likelihood that these very small particles that we're not normally thinking about when we think about uh, you know sneezing uh, that that could be uh, an issue there. Is that part of what might have contributed to the transmission on the cruise ships? Yeah, I, I'm not sure uh, what the latest on that is, but um, I, I, I just saw a headline in the past week that said that they saw no evidence for aerosol transmission uh, on, say, uh, what is that, the uh, princess, the diamond princess or whatever that was. The, uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually uh, very sure. The, the Diamond Princess actually is one of the studies that um, supports this idea of aerosol transmission, but in a different way. It turns out that a group of patients from the Diamond Princess were put into a hospital in Nebraska. And they found, they, they again sort of looking around after uh, that, that had happened and found uh, areas like the, uh, the uh, air conditioner uh, intakes and things like that where they actually could find uh, viruses that had, that had sort of transported there. So they, that's another one of those studies that came up this week that um, seems to suggest that you can actually uh, exhale these uh, into very small particles. Thanks, Jim. Are we ready to get to questions? Okay, hey. Uh, the first set of questions is, is still on the coronavirus and antibodies. And these are questions that came up last week that we didn't get a chance to answer because we focus more on the mental health aspects of this. As Cindy and Ruth pointed out, the trifecta of pandemic, uh, the economic aspects, the virus itself, and then the mental health. So today, um, Here's our first question. I read that coronavirus, that COVID-19 has some genes similar to the HIV virus. What does that mean? Does it mean once a person is infected, they will carry the virus the rest of their life and show symptoms when their immune system becomes stressed or weak? This is something we know the answer to, I wonder. Eric, have you got this one? Um, yeah, there are, there are some similar genes that are produced, but these viruses are so different. You cannot really begin to compare mm -hmm. coronavirus with, uh, with the HIV. Um, I mean, yes, there are some things, but you know, there's no indication that once we have coronavirus, we will keep this for any length of time. HIV, I mean, it's with us for those who have it. Um, they have it for life. And it's totally manageable, even though it's not totally, it's not curable. But with coronavirus, this is a relatively short time period that these viruses will stay around. There is no indication and nothing I've read in the literature that says that these viruses will be around for any period of time. So I, I don't think there is cause to worry about that. Um, there's cause to worry about dogs. <laughs> I think the dog's jealous. <laughs> Dog disagrees. <laughs> Jim, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, nope. Yeah. I have nothing to add. Yeah, no, I would just totally agree with what Eric had to say. There's no evidence that it stays permanently for those who recover. Uh, we would have antibodies, and that is what our own body produces in response to the virus those antibodies may stay with us for a long period of time. And that's the big question is, once you're infected and you recover and your body has developed its own antibodies to the virus, does that make you immune from reinfection and or um, is it a long lasting protection or is it something that would wear off after a few months or years? And all of those are unknowns at this point in time, as far as I'm aware. That's right. There's no question that we're, we're developing immune responses to these viruses. 
mm-hmm. those who are infected. Um, but the long-term impact of this is not really clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably the best indication is from people who were infected with the, the original SARS-1 back in 2003. Um, and, uh, and the follow-up is that there is long-term immunity but, you know, with, with the level of infection and the number of people who are infected and how broad this is, this um, uh, COVID-19 is, it's still, as you say, Cindy, it's still out there with the studies, long-term studies have yet to be done. Thank you. So the next question is to the antibody test itself. Is there any new development in the antibody test? Is there any antibody test out there that only tests the anti- antibody for new viruses and does not show the false positives because of the coronavirus? Eric, do you want to take that one? Um, you know, the, the, big, the big news recently is on the antigen test rather than the antibody test. I mean, once we have antibodies, when you're initially exposed, you get a group of relatively <laughs> low affinity um, antibodies that are short-lived, but then you get the main antibodies called IgG antibodies that will stay around for, you know, in many cases for our lifetimes. Um, I'm just going to close the door on the damn dogs. That's all. See you guys. <laughs> They're having a good time out there. Um, but in terms of, uh, of this virus, we are still at an early stage in understanding how things work. Uh, I think there's every reason to be optimistic that when we're exposed, we're infected, whether it's, whether it's, uh, whether it's an infection with, um, with symptoms or whether it's completely asymptomatic, we will develop antibodies to this. And these antibodies will protect us. Forward. So I think there's every cause for... Um, for optimism in terms of the actual antibody tests um, that uh, the question asked um, there are antibody tests and our colleague who was here a few weeks ago Phil Feltner uh, has really been been wonderful in doing this because he can show which specific proteins that are made by the virus are recognized by those antibodies but right now the antigen test appears to be the most straightforward thing you take your serum you throw them onto, uh, you put them onto uh, a plate or a dish or an assay, and you can see whether or not your antibodies, the, ser- the antibodies in your serum, actually respond to this virus. Thank and you. so, this is good. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, dear. Well, and I'll I'll just maybe add briefly that there are a whole host now of blood antibody tests that have been released on the market. Many of them are not rigorously studied or FDA approved. So their sensitivity and specificity, that is, you know, false positive, false negative rate are, are widely varied. Uh, some of the tests are, are more accurate than others. Uh, and so there's quite a range. And it's a little bit of the Wild West right now in antibody testing because a lot of tests have been released with very uh, little verification but i think i'd love to hear more from jim about the masks and what have you found about the mask what should we be doing i think we're going to get to that you want me to talk about it now well i don't know if we should jump over but i don't i don't want to miss i think you're the feature this is the big question of the night (laughs) there are a few more questions but let's go to masks and we'll, we'll come back around absolutely okay um, so, this is close to my heart, Jim, I think. What is the community value of wearing masks? Is it a public good, something we all contribute to um, that eventually benefits everyone? Well, watch out for peanut things. Sorry? We got a hot, we got a hot mic. Oh. Okay. We're muted. There you go. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think I think that, um, and and it's taken I think a lot of people to kind of come around to this idea that we wear masks um, as much for everyone else as we do for ourselves. And in fact, you could argue more so. Uh, <clears throat> I think um, 
I think, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty as, as to uh, what exactly we expect out of masks, what, how much performance. If, of course, if we're doctors working in a hospital, we don't want to take any chances at all. We, we wear the best filtration possible. Um, but, but no, we can't, uh, we can't live our lives this way. We can't um, be expected to, I mean, it's not super necessary, I think. Well, I think we're going to get at, at what, what to do outdoors, but I, I don't believe it's necessary outdoors. Um, but, but we do, I think, need masks. I think we need to uh, start thinking that we should never leave our house without having a mask with us. I mean, I, I think that we just have to start thinking this way. Um, it doesn't mean you have to wear it. But it does mean that um, you need to have a mask because you may find yourself in a situation where you can't um, do the physical distancing. You can't, um, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't stay six to fifteen feet away or something like that. And I think that in those situations, uh, I, I, I would love to live in a world where everyone uh, who has the mask could just whip those things out, and I would feel much better in that in those kind of situations. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's sort of a society question. Uh, what type of mask? Because there's so, such a wide variation in the types of masks yeah, and yeah. their steel and microns and so forth. Can you say this, more? This might be a, a, maybe a good opportunity to just really quickly uh, sort of uh, mention how I got into this uh, mask business. It's kind of a, it's not my day job, uh, but it has become my life now for the last uh, month or two. Um, so we, when we, uh, we when, when, uh, when the lockdown started, we were approached by uh, different, uh, you know, we being the university, uh, the Department of Chemistry was approached by different organizations asking for more information about uh, mass infiltration. And I said, well, I'm an aerosol scientist. I know something about particles and well, viruses are born on particles to some extent. So I should be able to uh, use some of my equipment in my lab to, uh, to, to at least at very least test the materials that are being proposed um, to protect ourselves. And so uh, working with uh, somebody in the medical school, Mike Kleinman, and then a, a new professor for UCI, actually Terry Sanger, who actually also happens to be uh, very involved in the Children's Hospital at Orange County. Uh, we uh, teamed up and uh, decided that we were going to not just study mask materials, but propose mask designs of our own. And so um, the, uh, the first thing we did, of course, is to uh, read up on the very large body of literature that's around about what's already known about filtration properties of common materials. And um, one of the first things we learned is that uh, any kind of woven material uh, that's made of thread, so uh, we're talking about uh, t-shirts, we're talking about uh, pillowcases, anything um, that's made uh, using a woven pattern of threads, uh, while, while pretty good, uh, doesn't really uh, perform as well as what we call non-woven materials. So non-woven materials include anything where individual fibers that actually constitute a thread are unraveled uh, or, or just uh, not, not put into threads at all, but sort of tangled with each other. And so uh, we started exploring uh, different sources of non-woven material uh, and uh, we've come across, uh, well, I can show you because I'm sitting here in my lab. Uh, we've uh, studied all of these different materials, uh, different things uh, like uh, filters designed for furnaces. Um, um, and, and we've come uh, with uh, a few, uh, uh, I think, uh, important uh, things to note, okay? So the first thing I, I want to say about masks, and just in a very general sense, is that uh, having a comfortable mask is actually a, a good, it makes it a good mask. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, I could uh, make an argument that this mask is a, is a good mask, but if I put a coffee filter in it, I would make it a great mask, right? Because a coffee filter filters lots of particles. Well, what would happen if I put a very high efficiency filter in it? is that uh, my breath would, would suddenly uh, find a resistant path in front of my mouth 
and my breath would find a better route. Uh, that is to say, it'll go right up into my glasses, it'll go across the sides of my face, it'll go down my chin. And, uh, and so in that case, it's much better to have a mask that you can actually breathe through than it is to have a mask that's a very good filter. And so um, it, it, it's sort of an optimization process. You want, a, you, you want a filter that filters well, but you don't want a filter that filters so well that it's resistant to your breath passing through it. And so we kind of took a step back and looked at sort of maybe less, less high tech, but, but also less resistant materials. And so we came up with a few suggestions that we uh, actually discuss on our webpage. One, sorry to interrupt, but if, as directly related to this in the chat um, uh, window, people are, someone said that the, the mask design uh, uses unavailable shop cloths. Um, assuming yeah. that they, if that's true, are there, are there, are there alternatives? Is there, is there a second best that we could get yeah. readily? So, so we've, uh, we, we, we recognize, uh, and actually, um, what I've actually spent the past week doing more than anything, and I wasn't sure that, uh, that that's true. I, I, I believe, you know, everything that we thought was commonly available is no longer commonly available. Even elastic straps that we use to hold masks on our face are hard to find, I'm sure. Um, what we've uh, looked at in, in terms of non-woven materials uh, are things like uh, reusable shopping bags. Uh, so here is, uh, here is one that I've cut up. Uh, it, it said, it used to say the Beckman Foundation on it. And uh, it's, it's this, um, it's this kind of gauzy, many of you may have this actually in your home. It's this kind of gauzy um, polyester material that actually works quite well. Uh, it's very air permeable. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, as much as I just sort of bad mouthed uh, woven materials, uh, if you were to make a good fitting mask out of, um, say, uh, this is muslin cloth, so this is just a woven, um, much like a pillowcase that you would have in your home. Um, it, if it fits well and, it's, and you can breathe through it, then uh, you, have a, you have a great design. And, and I, I would say, uh, like I was trying to say uh, previously, um, it's, it's more important that you're comfortable with it, it's more important that you can breathe through it and that you actually can use it than it is that it's filtering out 95% of all the particles that's, uh, that's being uh, blown into your, uh, you know, that you're being exposed to. Why is that, Jim? Shouldn't we want to have it filter out the actual particles? Uh, well, of course we would, yeah, yeah. It's just that, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is that uh, we're, we're trying to find, we're trying to make masks out of material that really never were designed to be masks to begin with. And so uh, we haven't yet found the, the perfect material that we all have sitting in our homes that uh, that that uh, is 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 highly uh, permeable to our breath, but that filters out 90, 95 or ninety nine percent of the particles, and so we have to make some compromises. And so uh, I think that we can have um, masks that uh, filter out fifty percent of particles uh, that uh, can actually. Um, be made with, with materials like shopping bags and other uh, similar kind of materials that, uh, uh, that we all do have in our, in our homes. And so we have been, um, been fast at work trying to uh, do this. We're actually right now in the process of uh, publishing our, our work in a, in a peer review journal because we want uh, this to go through the peer review process and we want to have a good scientific basis for what we are recommending. And so uh, in a way, our, our, our sort of release of our information is being um, held up a little bit by the fact that we want to make sure that we're doing this right. But, but uh, I, I hear you, uh, it, it's really, uh, important and and we are working really hard and really fast, but we're trying to come up with as many different if, if anything just sort of informing people of um, Well, if you do go to you know that that ripped up t-shirt that you have in your in your in your rag box um, Just how well can you expect that to perform? Those are the kind of questions that we want to be able to answer That's great. That's really helpful. I think um, the the context I think is everything 
Um, I read a, a question in an article that you sent me today, um, and I thought that que the question was um, excellent. Would an important question be not do, um, do exhaled aerosols exist, rather how infectious are they? And I yeah. think that's still to be determined, isn't it, Cindy? Eric? Jim? Seems to be. Yeah. That's right. We, we don't know what is the dose of uh, exposure that is likely to result in an infection. And it's probably not the same for everyone. There may be some individuals more susceptible to lower doses of exposure than others. And so there are a whole host of questions that we don't have the answers to. And I wish we did. Yeah, we all wish we did. Thanks. So I will ask some of the questions that have been sent in and this. Zach, is there something coming up that I'm not seeing um, that should be addressed right away? Um, you know, I, I, one, I'll just uh, very quickly, uh, someone was wondering about the size, the ideal size of, um, of the mask, how much of the face needs to be covered by the mask? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this kind of goes to the question of, uh, of proper fit, I, I suppose. Um, the, the primary leakage point of all masks uh, that I've noticed have, is basically around the bridge of the nose. Um, and I don't, I have not yet, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not seeing the right uh, one, but I have not yet found a design that has been able to uh, address that issue uh, without having some kind of um, wire band or something like that uh, to actually cover up that leakage point. Um, otherwise, um, you know, the, the key, I think, is to cover as much of your face as possible. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a wonderful mask uh, made by a group of uh, uh, a garment company called Sway in Los Angeles. Uh, we tested this. Uh, it, it, it looks great. But it's it's uh, it's I think a little bit too uh, doesn't cover enough on the side, and what we actually found was that this was a big point of leakage, and so the bigger you can make a mask uh, to uh, to make to allow your breath to actually go through the fabric, the better the mask will perform, uh, both inhaled and exhaled, of course. Um, I think that that maybe covers it. Well, and I'll also say that the masks that are really uh, the most effective are those that are really sealed against the face. They're yeah. really tightly sealed. And it, you get the feeling that you're kind of suffocating after a little while wearing those masks. And yeah. you can still breathe through them, but it takes more effort. And so those are the really effective masks, but they're so uncomfortable that the majority of people wouldn't wear them for very long. And that's the N95, Cindy? Well, a N95 that's fitted tightly to your face. So it has to be sized appropriately. And it's basically clamped down all around your face so there's no leakage. And it's also a kind of a dense fab, whatever the fiber is. Yeah. And so it's just, you, you, you feel like you want to take it off right away. Yeah. Well, you're breathing in your own carbon dioxide, aren't you? Well, I mean, it does diffuse out, but you're probably rebreathing at least some of your CO2. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not something that is very comfortable. And that's that balance point that we have to weigh between, you know, feeling that you're suffocating to you're able to breathe, but reducing transmission. Let me get to some of the questions that have been looming for a week or so um, while we were waiting for you to arrive, Jim. <laughs> um, should you wear a mask while running, biking, or doing outdoor exercise? Is there any danger to wearing a mask during vigorous exercise? Is there any danger uh, in physiologically uh, to wearing a mask? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I know for a fact that actually people do what they call altitude training with masks, which is to deprive themselves of oxygen uh, to simulate a high altitude situation. And so I used to uh, take my son to uh, high school and every morning we drive down California, 
we'd see a guy with one of these respirators on that was limiting his oxygen while he was running. I thought, God, what a terrible thing to do. So I think that's really the only, uh, you just, you're just not going to enjoy it very much. Um, yeah, the whole thing about exercise and masks uh, has really, um, it really became a very hot uh, topic when this Dutch-Belgian study came out uh, about two or three weeks ago, I'm going to say. Um, this is a modeling study where fluid dynamics was performed on, um, they actually already had some data on uh, on airflow around cyclists. Uh, I, I think this were like um, data from the Tour de France or something like that, where they, where they took bicycles at different speeds or they took runners at different speeds and they calculated the fluid flow around them. And so what they did was they uh, came to the conclusion that, uh, if, that there could be a wake of particles. And remember now that we're talking particles, are they viral? We don't know. Uh, behind a cyclist or runner, um, much, much further than the sort of six foot uh, distance that we've been thinking about. Um, now, what happened with this Del Belgian study is that uh, it turned out that one of the authors uh, had, a, had, a, had a close family member, I think a parent or something like that, who actually died of uh, COVID-19 and felt very passionate about uh, getting this, the word out of this research. And so, like many people, uh, they published and, and started uh, they, before the paper was actually peer reviewed, they started um, uh, granting interviews and getting out on the social media and really getting the word out. And I think a lot of you maybe have seen this study. It's very alarming. It makes us all have to pause and think about uh, really what it means to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to give ourselves physical distance out, outdoors. Um, but, and I think that uh, it was a well done study. I think that, um, what I like to think about when I'm talk when I'm out in the morning, say walking my dog or something like that, is uh, imagine if the person I'm walking by is a smoker. Um, how far would I? And and this is not a very fair comparison. Smoke particles uh, remain in the air much longer than we think uh, these sort of micron-sized particles that could be aerosol carriers for for uh, coronavirus do. But just, just to be safe, imagine that I'm walking by somebody who's smoking. How far away would I need to be from that person to not smell the smoke, or at least not smell it very strongly? Well, it depends, right? It could be a breezy day. Uh, it could be upwind. Uh, it could be uh, I'm walking, say, in a very protected valley, in which case uh, I could be overwhelmed by the smoke. And so I think we all have to uh, be uh, a lot more cautious now, give ourselves a lot more room. Um, and, and, and I think think about it in this way of, uh, you know, if, what, if, what if that person were smoking, how far away would I need to be? And I think that, you know, at least me personally, so I'm speaking now from my own personal uh, perspective, that to me is what I'm comfortable with. And, and of course, you know, it goes both ways. I mean, I, I and I'm, I could be asymptomatic, and so I could actually be carrying it to somebody else as well. Um, Susan, you're muted. Thanks, Zach. Appreciate that. It was the dog business back and forth. Cindy, anything um, to add to that? No, I think that was a great response. We'll check. Um, Zach, is there anything that we need to be paying attention to in the chat, or shall I go back to questions in front of me? Um, no, I think you can continue. The last question was exactly about uh, what about um, wearing masks outside, and lo and behold, that was the first question on your list. So great, great job of thinking, you know, uh, being in tune <laughs> with, the list, with the chat. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. I've heard and read that the rule is wear a mask if in public if you cannot be six feet distance from others. What does in public mean? Do we need to wear masks while walking around you hills if we're six feet apart? I think, Jim, you answered that really well. I really like the analogy of um, the cigarette smoke. Is there anything else that either you or Cindy want to add to that? Um. No, I think I think just um, 
just just to say that uh, that you know the actual particles that carry the virus uh, are uh, uh, are much larger uh, than this. They 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 but they still are airborne. Um, I don't want people to be overly worried about the transmission of the virus outdoors. Uh, in, uh, in, I think uh, in China, there was a study uh, uh, looking at uh, outbreaks of, uh, of, of COVID-19. Some 300 plus uh, different cases were explored. Uh, there may have been one or two that they attributed to outdoor transmission. So you're much better off outdoors than you are uh, indoors. Now we haven't uh, mentioned much about indoors, but I really think that uh, it's the indoor environment that we should most be uh, thinking about uh, when we think about the need for wearing masks. Um, because, uh, you know, obviously that is a completely different situation um, altogether. And so, you know, I think we'll be wearing masks in grocery stores for some time now in the future, so. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's probably right. Cindy, how about you? Well, I'll just share the story that um, back in March when the infection really was clearly coming uh, and before the shutdown, we were told within the healthcare system that we were not advised to wear masks, and in fact, we're restricted from wearing masks because there was a fear that we were going to run out of them and, because, and deplete our PPE, our personal protective equipment, and that we should be saving the masks for the really high-risk situations like when we're caring for ill patients and so forth. And if we wore them all the time, we'd run out you know, at a much higher, faster rate. Uh, and now in the last week or two, We've been instructed that we must wear masks indoors at all times, right? Uh, whether we're with patients or not. And I think it's a reflection of the shifting understanding of the transmission and probabilities and really doing everything that we can to maintain a safe environment, particularly in healthcare settings, because we want patients to feel comfortable and that it's safe to come for healthcare and we're actually getting quite worried that the numbers of patients coming in for visits or to the hospital has declined so precipitously that now we're losing patients because of non-COVID situations, just because they're so fearful of coming for healthcare. That's a big concern. I think that's, <laughs> as, the, as the weeks roll on, I think that is going to be something that we'll be talking about in the future. Uh, the next question is to um, children and wearing masks. I'm always wondering if it's beneficial to have my little ones wear, wear any mask. They're almost three and five. Of course, we don't go anywhere crowded with them just for casual walks around the neighborhood. When they put on a mask, they actually touch their faces more, I feel. It might be harmful. Um, I wonder about my grandchildren as well, um, whether it's important for them to wear masks or not wear masks. Now, these, th this question goes to outside, so I think you've covered that a little bit, but um, what do we understand about children and, and masks? So, so, uh, <clears throat> so I, think, I think maybe uh, Cindy or Eric can, can talk a little bit about children and, and uh, and asymptomatic as asymptomatic carriers of uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, I, I, I looked up the recommendation because I was curious. Uh, the recommendation from the CDC is that children over two years of age uh, should wear should wear masks, um, and that's because uh, there there is um, you know. There's no way, of course, we know for sure, but there's suspicion that children could uh, be carriers of this and um, without you know, any protection at all, could be uh, spreading it uh, through the same ways that we've been talking up to now. Um, and it's true that uh, kids get all slimy and, and <laughs> the masks uh, um, don't, don't handle children and children don't handle masks very well. Uh, the recommendation there is to, uh, 
have lots of reusable mass and to um, and to uh, and to uh, recycle them. Um, I, I I don't think we really uh, as a as a society. I don't think we've really thought about that very well because uh, most of the mass that you see in the mass market now are are not sized for children. They don't fit children very well. And uh, I don't think that they would uh, protect children or, or the people around them uh, particularly well. And I think that's an area that um, maybe needs some more, some more thought. We, we've certainly thought about it. Um, when we are developing, for example, our, our no-sew folding masks, uh, we are um, we are we are sizing them uh, in many different sizes so that they can fit different size spaces and things like that. Good information, but Jim. Are you su are you suggesting then that are you referring to the outdoors or would the would the situation that you just described for adults being outdoors that that would still apply to to children or not? That's what that's what I'm suggesting, Eric. Is that uh, is that uh, we 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 shouldn't we shouldn't imagine that children are not um, are not potential a uh, you know uh, carriers or or susceptible to uh, infection. Um, but again, I, I I would defer to others that may uh, be able to shed shed more light on that. Um, but that to, in my view, just sort of logically thinking, uh, it, it it means that um, we we need to be protected and protect our, our children as, as much as we do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Cindy, family physician, weigh in on this? Well, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I agree with everything Jim has said. And as a mother and a grandmother, uh, you know, with, uh, with toddlers, it's really near impossible to keep, uh, you know, their faces clean or their hands clean and they're drooling and you know slobbering all over the place a lot and so it's very impractical to try to keep a mask clean on a child i think maybe as children get older towards school age it's probably uh easier but preschool i just think it's so problematic and you know one of the challenges of a mask is because you're you know, you have to presume that the external surface of the mask could be contaminated. And so when a child has something on their face, it's annoying, they're touching it a lot, then they're touching their face and eyes and so forth. So you wonder if the mask is doing more good than harm, right? And so uh, I think it just, it's probably going to be age and developmental, developmentally dependent on whether that's even feasible. And it's probably going to be somewhere maybe around three to four, I would imagine, before you could really keep a mask on a child. That that would be more beneficial than harmful, in my opinion. Yeah, that's oh. that's a that's a really good point. That's a good point, and I, I think uh, it, it speaks. I think it speaks to the dual role of a mask, though. It protects the child, but it also protects people uh, from from the possibility that the child could be a carrier. So, mm -hmm. one case. Uh, you should worry very much about uh, contamination on the surface of the mask, and I think we all should think about that. In the other case, uh, the mask is you essentially, uh, and and so if you, you know, were to were to touch it, uh, it, it would would be less of a less of an issue. But I don't know how we can tell the difference, frankly. So mm -hmm. we should all imagine that, uh, depending on our situation, if we're outside playing or something like that, it's a different situation. But we should all imagine that. Uh, masks could be contaminated uh, from from other people. I think I'll um, quote you with with that, Jim. The mask is you. <laughs> we are the mask. I've been working with masks well, too long, I think. <laughs> and let let me just pick up. I see a question that's been repeated Great. a couple times about how to properly put on and off a mask. Great. Yeah. Oh. Yes, run the sentence. Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, or in one of us to, to discuss this. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think I think the I think the real key is uh, is is to uh, is to do so without um, physically without touching the mass material itself, um, and uh, and so you know the the best way to do it is to actually uh, 
grab the mask by uh, the straps. Uh, if you have a if you have ear straps, or if it has if it goes all the way around the head, and to um, and and to uh, very carefully remove those, and then hold the mask by the straps, and then put it either in a in a paper bag or something like that to sit for a while, or put it on a hook to sit for a while. Uh, and then, you know, if you're done uh, wearing it for a day to uh, have maybe three or four other masks that have similarly been sitting out for a while that you can uh, go to uh, so that, uh, you know, you have this sort of repeating regimen uh, if you can't wash masks all the time or if you have, um, you know, some disposable masks that you can actually probably wear more than once, a, you know, one time, one day. But uh, that's my uh, sort of more practical advice about how to deal sort of day in and day out with donning masks and, and taking off masks and things like that. So a wardrobe of masks, as it were. <laughs> well, and I'll just Monday, add that Tuesday, it, Wednesday, Thursday. It's, it's not recommended to have the mask down on your neck or up over your head, because again, the chance of cross-contamination becomes high. And so you need to treat the mask as if it's a, potentially contaminated item on the, especially on the outside you don't want to touch that part um, and so you would fold it if you have to put it somewhere you you know fold it so, and then I try to just all my cloth masks I just wash them out with hot water and detergent on a daily basis and let them sun dry and I feel like you know at least that's reducing any kind of contamination that might be a, on the mask okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, is there anything else in the chat? Um, we have one more question, Cindy, that I think goes to you. Um, so I, I'm just thinking if there isn't anything else on the chat, um, let's wrap up masks and I will ask you this particular question. Jim, take us out with masks. <laughs> take you out with masks. Uh, take, it, take our masks out or something. Want a, want a final comment on masks? So, um, so, so I, I, I don't know if, uh, if this is easy uh, to let people know or not, but we do have a website that we've developed on our mask project. Uh, in addition to um, some of the results that we have in our lab, I've been collecting now, not full time. If I were, I'd have hundreds of different uh, sources, but I've collected um, some papers and some journal, um, you know, both magazine articles, but also scientific uh, articles that I feel um, reach me and, and, and give me uh, some, some good advice. And so the, the site uh, is going to be sites, uh, S-I-T-E-S dot U-C-I dot E-D-U, and then a slash, and then U-C-I mask. So that's U-C-I-M-A-S-K. And so if anyone's uh, curious about um, some of the uh, references I've been talking about, some of the studies that I've been mentioning, um, a lot of those are, are there uh, on, the, uh, on the website. And I guess my only um, sort of parting comment is, um, is relax. Uh, make, make sure your mask is comfortable. Make sure it's, if, if, it, if it's uh, something that uh, you loathe wearing, um, then you have the wrong mask. If uh, it's something that's fogging your glasses, it probably is just not fitting you properly. And so, uh, and, and uh, just um, don't, don't overdo it. Uh, just find, find something that works for you. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be uh, the best mask in the world. It has to be a mask that you'll want, you're willing to wear. And if we can get people to wear them, if we can get people to um, just relax about them and to, to always have them with them as they go out in the world, then I think we can really uh, make a huge difference in getting, you know, licking this whole thing. That's really sound. That's great. Thank you so much. Cindy, was there anything else that you wanted to add? And again, Jim, thanks for being here. Well, I just have seen a few questions about transmission through the eye. And oh. I want to say that you know, the eye is a mucosal surface and you know we can get droplets onto the eye mucosa and it could be absorbed but that's probably a lower a much lower 
uh, type of transmission than through our respiratory tract, than through our nose or mouth. I don't know, Eric. I could add uh, just a word to that, uh, mm -hmm. Cindy. Um, yeah, I mean, when you, one word. <laughs> yes. But um, so there are cells in our, our conjunctiva that actually express the ACE2 receptor for the COVID-19. And there are incidences of conjunctivitis that go along with this. Uh, and this is in the literature and you can find this. But, uh, you know, in my reading, my agreement is completely with you that what the role of this is in transmission or anything else uh, is minor compared with, with inhalation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for picking up on that, Cindy. I know that there was a question that I completely dropped. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for being here. Um, one final question. I'm interested to know how, um, how they make decisions in the hospital about treatment. Let's say that I was in respiratory distress enough so that I went to the hospital, but my healthcare directive says specifically that I don't want any heroic, um, any heroic supplied on me. So would they restrict, would they refrain from intubating me, putting me on a ventilator? If so, would they keep me comfortable with drugs like morphine, even though it might hasten my death? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a great question. And uh, number one, uh, we, uh, as physicians, we do not treat patients against their will. And so it's most important that we know their will, their wishes for what they do and they don't want in ways of being treated. Now, when you say heroics, that could mean different things to different people. And so we try to specify with our patients their wishes to the point of when we say no code, that means no um, CPR, a shocking of the heart, um, and uh, emergency resuscitation. Um, that's not necessarily the same as no intubation. Uh, some people need to be get, get a breathing tube put down their throat and put on a ventilator, but they never code. They, we, we don't have to do cardiac resuscitation. It's just they can't breathe properly. So I think it's very important that all of us take a moment to review uh, what are our wishes if we were to become seriously ill and have we communicated those wishes to our loved ones if we're not able to speak for ourselves? Have we written those wishes down so they're crystal clear? So there's no question if something comes up and you are not able to speak for yourself, which can happen sometimes very quickly in the course of this illness. People have been known to, to go from being pretty much okay to crashing in, in 30 minutes or less. And so, so I think the more we think through um, those are wishes and make sure our loved ones know and they, they're recorded. I think the more likely those wishes are to be uh, respected. And I'll tell you as, you know, physician having been in those circumstances many times trying to guess, you know, well, nobody knows because nobody ever talked about it. And then you're left with, if we don't know, if we don't have any kind of express wishes, then we basically are committed to doing everything possible. And so we, we do everything that we can to keep a patient alive as long as possible. Uh, in some circumstances now, we're talking about when a patient who has severe COVID, say they're even on a, a ventilator and they, they, their heart stops, should we even do cardiac resuscitation? Because number one, we know the chance of that patient surviving is very, very remote to zero. And number two, we know that just the act of the resuscitation exposes a lot of other health workers. And so in those circumstances, we're now really uh, reconsidering whether patients with severe COVID infection would even go through resuscitation, if that's even ethically appropriate because of, of these things I've mentioned. So again, express your wishes, write them down, talk to your loved ones, you know, inevitably we're all going to die. So that's the only thing we can really be sure of, right? Uh, but we just don't know when and we don't know how. Uh, but the more clear you are of your wishes, if and when that time comes, then the more likely we can respect those wishes. 
That's a wonderful question and a, uh, and a wonderful answer. Thank you. That is, um, it's not something that, that we like to think about, but it, it's very meaningful in this situation. So thank you. And that is, that is our hour. We're exactly nine o'clock. So I want to thank you, Jim, for being here. I want to thank all of you. Thank you, Cindy. Of course, you're just a wonderful host. Hobart, will you take us out? Yeah, thank you. Again, thank you, Dr. Hawk and Dr. Smith. Um, these uh, uh, talks have been extraordinarily informative and uh, reassuring knowledge is uh, uh, the balm here in Argilead. Uh, it's been the uh, uh, substance of, of, I think, community um, well-being psychologically as well as physically. Uh, we've had uh, 45 people on tonight, and you say that uh, that might be a small number, but the, the ripple effect of the conversations that we have with others and the knowledge that we share from these talks uh, uh, impact uh, the entire community. I want to remind people that if there's something they want to see again, or if they want others in the community to share this information, they can go to the YouTube channel. And links to the YouTube channel can be found both on the Facebook page of Welcoming and Wellness and also uh, uhills.org on the page entitled uh, Caring for Each Other in the Age of Coronavirus. Uh, again, I encourage everyone to check out information on uh, uhills.org. It is uh, being updated uh, a couple of times a week, so there are reasons to, to check and get new information. There's a lunchtime talk, a series of lunchtime talks uh, run by um, Public Health, and uh, we've got a link to those on the webpage. Uh, the next one is going to be um, uh, Dr. Andrew Neumann, who has uh, uh, done a right. great deal of study on uh, the 1918 uh, pandemic. So uh, he has uh, information that I'm sure will be useful to us all. Um, once again, thank you, everybody. Uh, please be sure to uh, join us next week. And thank you so much, Susan, Eric, uh, Zach, everyone who's uh, made all of this work so smoothly. Thank you. Our pleasure. Have a Good wonderful week. Good night, Good sleep. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Stay well. It's off.